Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. You probably know by now that we study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular series is entitled Biblical Missionaries. What would a biblical missionary be? Well, our lesson for this time is a summary of what we've discussed this whole quarter. It's lesson number 13 for September 26th of 2015. And the question in the title is, must the whole world hear? Do we have to carry the message to everybody that lives on planet Earth, or is that not necessary? Before we begin, of course, we always like to start with a word of prayer. May we encourage you to bow your heads with us. Our wonderful Father, it's such a privilege to study your word, to think about you, to discuss it together with people of different views and different ideas. Help us to comprehend what you want us to know is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, of course, in this series we've talked about a lot of different characters through the Bible, but there's an underlying theme through the whole thing, and that theme has been, obviously, are we really witnessing the way we should be? Are we true witnesses? And what is the role of Christians in witnessing to others? We have noted how people in a variety of different circumstances have been able to witness to those around them. And this is one of the questions that many people have not thought of, but I would like you to think of right now. God could have used angels to do all the witnessing. Why didn't he? Wouldn't angels have done a much better job than we do? I don't think so. You don't think so? No. Because You're better I than an angel? No, but they're so <laughs> far removed. I think when someone who has experienced something tells you about it, I think it has an extra little... Mm. You, don't, you don't think that the guardian angels have had sufficient experience with humans? Isn't another name for angels messengers? Yes. Yeah. So I think they've been involved more than we really realize. Yes. Mm -hmm. Elsewhere in the universe besides, as well as heaven. Right here. They've been involved right here. You're talking oh. about non-humans. That's right. right. Yeah. But well, they're still... Well, then how can non-humans tell us about... Oh, they can appear us. as human beings. What? They've d they can appear as human beings. They've done it many times. I know they can appear like human beings, they're, but they're still not human beings. Would you, if, if an angel appeared here and looked like a human being, would you be able to tell? You might be able to. You might be able to. Yeah. I mean, how am I supposed to answer that? Probably right <laughs> now, while it's while the action is going on, maybe upon reflection, you might say that. Uh, but well, one thing I can say for sure, and that's that we need the experience of witnessing. Right. If you want to understand a subject, we've got some teachers here in the crowd. If you want to understand this subject, try teaching it. If you can't teach it, you probably don't understand it. So I think that may be the biggest reason why God wants us to do the witnessing. Figure out how much we don't know. <laughs> we probably learn more in attempting to explain it to somebody else, maybe than the person we're trying to explain it to. I was sitting next to a, uh, a, a professor, a doctor teaching uh, a resident. This, this is a, a young woman who has, uh, already has her doctorate and she's working on her specialty and sitting Next, so she, just in the course of, course of discussing the case, she said, man, there's so many things I don't know. And I turned to her and I said, man, you have a good education, don't you? <laughs> the purpose of education is to figure out how much you don't know. <laughs> That's right. So how essential is it? Is it just that it's good for me to experience this? It's, a, it's the benefit of this whole thing. The, the, the purpose of the whole plan to have humans involved is uh, just because it's good for them as individuals, or is there some other essentialness in it all? Well, and the essence of the question we're going to really struggle with in this lesson is, is it possible for people to be saved somewhere in darkest Africa or maybe in communist China if they have never, ever heard of Jesus? Yes. Is my answer. We, we have no idea. That was idea. simple, wasn't it? Yeah, but we have no idea how the numbers, but certainly you might put it in a jargon we understand the cream of the crop. Yes, 
the back areas of Mount Hagen in New Guinea, the jungles of the Philippines, Nepal, jungles in Cambodia, there's people being brought in by listening to little transistor radios and stuff. Yeah. We have no idea. Or recordings. Yes. Yeah, that's true. Well, some of you are aware that this discussion has really led to hours and hours and hours of discussion among Christians and theologians this question of what we call special revelation, that is you have to know the Christian message and you have to know about Jesus Christ or you can't be saved. And others who say, no, God is revealed even in nature. And if that's all you've been exposed to is nature, uh, then that's what God expects from you. And of course, the, the questions that, that we could ask in that respect is, what about all the people who lived before Jesus was born? There's no way they could have heard about Jesus unless it was a special revelation from God. Um, so that's the question we need to think about. And there are those who claim that it's impossible to be saved unless you hear, understand, and accept the messages taught by one particular Christian denomination. I think we're going to be held accountable for mm. extra information that we've been lucky enough to be exposed to. And yeah. then if you turn your back on it, going to have some answering to do. Yeah, yeah. What about the young people? I, I know some young people who said, I don't want to read those books by Ellen White because if I read them, I'll be responsible. <laughs> well, by contrast, there are those who believe that all religions are equal and you could take any path you like to salvation. How do Adventists generally feel about that? I think that all of us know people that we feel sometimes are even better Christians mm -hmm. who know nothing about any, that attend no church, that really don't have any deep belief. And yet, as human beings, they're, they seem to float to the top Wonderful much people. better than many of the people that we sit next to in church. Yeah. Well, let's make one point clear. Is it not clear from Scripture that God would like to save as many people as possible? Yes. yes. And there's lots of verses. Um, He'd like to save everybody. Yeah, if that were possible, yes. One example is found in Revelation 15, verse 3. Here's this, it's the, the, the people in heaven singing the song of Moses, the servant of law of God, and the song of the Lamb, singing, Lord God Almighty, how great and wonderful are your deeds, King of the nations, how right and true are your ways. So they're saying, when they see it's all over and God has done his thing, they're celebrating. That ought to be a good hint, huh? Mm -hmm. what, why is it not possible to save everybody? Well, do you think the devil could be saved? Well, I'm talking about humans right now. Okay, so you're going to you're going to sort of separate out here, huh? For now. You know, you know <laughs> maybe there's some humans that aren't very nice. <laughs> I've, but, I've I've got a bit of an answer, but I I think I think the the most compelling answer in my mind is simply this. Right. If you took those people to heaven, the great conivers would just be start would start all over again. Yeah. They they're not convinced, you know, they would be just as selfish there as they are here. They probably have an attitude of not wanting to take instruction. They don't want to learn. And if you go through the Old Testament, uh, God's major complaint is you don't listen. Mm -hmm. well, you don't listen, which means you don't take instruction. Well, what can you do? You have chaos if nobody admires the truth mm -hmm. and are willing to incorporate it into their thinking. But then the argument that follows that is that, well, evidently, um, the arguments for God are not persuasive enough. That's why, and I don't think that's the mm. case. I think the reason that God can't take everybody is because he's given us a choice and we make, we make the choice. Yeah, I think yeah. that's it. Well, the question, and, and I'm not going to argue with that. The question is, what does it do, you to, make, do to you to make those kind of choices? If you, if you read like the Gospels and you see the kind of person Jesus is, <coughs> and then you reject that, what does that do to you? And that's the way God is. Because uh -huh. Jesus says, you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Mm -hmm. So you want to know what God is like? Look at the Gospels. 
and you want to narrow it down, narrow it down to Gospel of John. Question. That's your prism. Yeah. And then Adventists, like at the beginning, had a semi-Aryan theology regarding a God few, and Jesus. A yeah. few yeah. that were some of the but church no. leaders. Yeah. They had that idea before they became Adventists, and yeah. they came to into Adventism with that idea. Well, are there people who believe that you must at least be a Christian in order to be saved? Yeah, there. Sure. There yes. Are some people yeah. think if you don't belong to my church denomination that you're yeah. not going to be saved. Well, in 1302 A.D., Pope Boniface the Eighth, in his papal bull Unum Sanctum, declared that it is absolutely necessary for salvation that every human creature be subject to the Roman Pontiff. Would you agree with him? No. no. <laughs> but there do you are, not, is it not that people from another belief believe it just as strongly really? as anyone else does? So if I belong to ABC Church and it says that these are the things to do and I do those things, I'm committed. I mean, I, I have, I'm as fully believing in that as we're believing in other things. So, yeah, and absolutely, I agree with that. The question is, are we committed to, let's say, study the Bible and discover the truth, or are we committed just to a set of beliefs, whatever those beliefs happen to be? But if in my church, this, I'm believing what, what I'm being told, I'm not being told you have to look at something else. I'm being told do this, and I'm doing that. That's why there's all warnings against believing on other human beings. Well, the, the classic pre, uh, um, passage that's used to say that we have to be, you know, do it God's way, we have to read the Bible, etc., is found in, in Acts 4, verse 12 here. Salvation is to be found to Him alone. In all the world, there is no one else whom God has given who can save us. Doesn't that sound pretty compelling? Yeah. And that fits your question? I'm just a, I'm asking, I'm asking you. Well, there you've got it, black and white, right out of the Bible. What more do we need, right? Well, if Jesus is in my church and nobody else's, well then, <laughs> yeah. then there yeah. you go. Well, and, and it, all you have to do is turn on the TV on Sunday morning, which is one of some of the religious channels, and basically what you hear is, let me perform a miracle or some kind of thing like that, some startling thing, and because... God has given me the power to do this thing, which may be a complete falsehood, but that's what they would claim. Therefore, you must believe whatever I say because it comes straight from God. And if you start listening down through the morning, you'll find out that these people disagree with each other. They can't all be telling the truth. So now what do you do? Run away. <laughs> <laughs> well, they'll swear. Is this reference in Acts uh, 4.12, is it referring to one God, our God, rather than to the people the, who had idols and many other gods at that time of the, of the uh, Unfortunately, world? Unfortunately, that doesn't work. Because what's happening here is Peter and John have been preaching the message about Jesus in the temple. They are arrested and thrown in prison. They're let out by God. I mean, they're miraculously released from prison. They go back to the temple. They're preaching the next morning. And the Sanhedrin says, get those guys. We need to talk to them. The Sanhedrin, who are supposed to be God's chosen people here on planet Earth, the leaders of God chose me, the leaders of the Jewish people, they call Peter and John in front of them. And, Jesus, and John, I mean, Peter is giving his little talk. And he says, look, you guys, you killed the Messiah. And his name is Jesus, and he comes from Galilee, from Nazareth. And you, if, unless you believe in him, there's not a chance in the world that you're going to be saved. And these are guys, he's preaching to people who have memorized the Old Testament. It was given decision time right there for those clowns. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, these are not wild worshipers he's talking to. Well, there's another sense in which that could be true. If you believe in the great controversy, sometimes referred to as a cosmic conflict, and you recognize the questions that were raised in that cosmic conflict right back in the Garden of Eden, those questions about what is the result of sin, who is telling us the truth, 
does death really result from sin? Those kind of questions. Those questions had to be answered, and they were answered by the life and death of Jesus. And without those questions being answered, I don't think anybody could be saved. Maybe even Satan would win. So that's another completely different sort of approach to that question. Well, Ellen White has some very compelling words about this subject. They're found in Desire of Ages, the book about the life of Jesus, at page 638, paragraph 2. Those whom Christ commands in the judgment may have known little of theology, but they have cherished his principles. Through the influence of the divine spirit, they have been a blessing to those about them. Even among the heathen are those who have cherished the spirit of kindness. Before the words of life had fallen upon their ears, they have befriended the missionaries, even ministering to them at the peril of their own lives. Among the heathen are those who worship God ignorantly. Those to whom the light is never brought by human instrumentality, and that would be the story of Jesus, would have to be, yet they will not perish. Though ignorant of the written law of God, they have heard his voice speaking to them in nature and have done the things that the law required. Their works are evidence that the Holy Spirit has touched their hearts and they are recognized as the children of God. Desire of Ages 638, paragraph 2. So, does that resolve the issue? I mean, if that's true, shouldn't we all just sit in our little ghettos and say, you people out there, just look at nature, you do your thing, you'll figure it out? Well, it clearly says those that did not know about the light, those that did not know about what the Bible says, that they've looked around the, the world and they've, they've come to those conclusions. We have a greater standard by which we're measured mm -hmm. because we do know more. We've given more uh, information. So we, we make it more difficult for them to be saved if we tell them more information. Better to remain ignorant. If they're, if they're satisfied. <laughs> I th I, I'm not sure that it makes it more difficult. I, I would see it more as a, a, an opening up of yeah, greater, I, I, a greater feeling, a greater understanding of these what kind of God's that, about. Yeah, these kind of people she's talking about here are the kind of people who would fall in love with the story of Jesus almost immediately. Will one of the many joys of eternity be being studying God's character? Mm-hmm. And so can't that joy start here on earth? Absolutely. That's why he came here. Wrote, uh, John 14, 15, 16, and 17. Three times he says, I came that you can have joy and have it now. Mm -hmm. Three times in three chapters. Is it possible that those people that find out about God through nature, they're actually more vulnerable to more punishment because they don't know as much? Well, if, they don't, if God is going to be fair, the person who knows less should receive less punishment. No, I'm that, talking that's about a, that, that implies a certain far, picture of God. I'm saying punishment as far as evil around the world. I mean, what do you we, mean by that? we, we are, Ellen White gives us all kinds of tips and ideas on how to make it through the last days. Mm -hmm. Whereas these people who have learned, mm -hmm. you know, about Jesus Christ, they, they may not know that, that what's coming up. Mm -hmm and they could go through a rougher time. Okay. Well, our lesson suggests something that I think we should discuss. It says, these people will be saved because God is able and willing. The, I'm using the lessons. This is from Monday, September 21. God is able and willing to apply the merits of Christ's work to whomever he wishes. That's crazy. Now, be careful. <laughs> I, <laughs> Let me, let me say Where it again. did you say that was found? That's, That's in the Sabbath School Bible Study Guide That's for Ma Monday, September 21. <laughs> okay, be careful. You'll have us thrown off the air here. <laughs> God is able and willing to apply the merits of Christ's work to whomever he wishes. Now, if you think about that for a moment, if we really believe that God wants to save as many as, as he possibly can, and he can do that by applying the merits of Christ's work to whomever he wishes, shouldn't he save everybody? I mean, if I can apply the merits of Christ, 
and require, apply Christ's merits to Yoli here, and that makes her savable, then I'll just go around the table, we'll all be savable, right? Well, maybe he does, but we reject it. Well, that's not what's implied by the lesson. Well, yeah, that's true, but I think, I think God does imply that he applies all of his merits on everybody, mm -hmm. and people reject it. Okay. I think we here are going to be judged differently, probably taking into account our backgrounds here and there, mm -hmm. to a different and higher standard than if you think back in the Dark Ages and uh, in Christ's time and before that. As you said earlier, those people are going to be judged, I think, on a simpler, on a simpler scale, for want of better terms. Mm -hmm. Why does, why does standards make any difference? I mean, where do you draw the line well, and say that the standard is, is right here and everybody over this line can be saved and not... I mean, where do you, mm -hmm. where do you put that? Well, you know what? I am very happy to tell you that God has never given any human being the responsibility of judging. Yes. <laughs> so I'll leave that one up. That one is way beyond my ability. Well, still, the question of standards is still yeah. there because yeah. somebody's going to judge according to standards. Yeah. So, have well, you made the standard? Well, there's a lot of a <laughs> lot of verses here. Let me just look at this one: Eight, Psalm 87, verses four to six. I will include. Now, this is way back in the Old Testament. This is 750 years, more or less, before Christ. God says, "I will include Egypt and Babylonia." when I list the nations that obey me. I will number among the inhabitants of Jerusalem the people of Philistia, Tyre, and Ethiopia. Of Zion it will be said that all nations belong there, and that the Almighty will make her strong. The Lord will write a list of the peoples and include them all as citizens of Jerusalem. I mean, and I could show you lots more from the New Testament, but doesn't that seem pretty clear that God wants to save everybody? Or should we say that, okay, I'm going to put my arms about my special group and it's only us guys that are going to be saved? Well, that was actually a conclusion drawn by many of the Israelites. Yeah, and by the Pope some years ago. <laughs> well, you did quote something there. You make mention of two organizations in the very here and now that maintain that. Yeah. And I think I've run into some folks nice. from time to time who even of my own denominational persuasion have kind of felt that. Yeah. Well, there's one way in which we could say clearly that God is trying to help everybody. Uh, let me read Acts 17. I'm going to read verses 25 and 28. And this is in Paul's sermon to the, the gurus, the intellect, intelligentsia of Athens. Nor does he need, that is, does, God does not need anything that we can supply by working for him, since it is he himself who gives life and breath and everything else to everyone. So at least God does what for us? He gives us life and breath, right? As someone has said, verse 28, in him we live and move and exist. It is as some of your poets have said, we too are his children. So... I mean, at least the God that much, God does at least that much for us, right? Well, another question, I don't know if we need to throw another one. We've already got some pretty big questions in front of us. Can we be saved by doing what is right? Careful. <laughs> I would say no because there's no supernatural power in doing things right. You have to go to God who has it. Don't you, don't you think you would have to have God with, working with you in order to do things right? Well, that's true. That's true, but that wasn't your question. You said doing things right. Well, but it also, what you mean by doing things right? I know atheists who do things, who do very good things, who build school, who do this, who do that. You know, you have to be, what do you mean by do things right? You mean do things according to the Bible or do things we think of as the good things to do? If you aren't saved by doing things right, then certainly you wouldn't be lost by doing things wrong. 
Mm. Boy, now listen to this. <laughs> oh, Venn <laughs> diagram. Right. How do we determine what is right? <laughs> yeah. There has to be. Well, see, that's the problem. There has to be some kind yeah. of a connection between us and the being that we believe in that determines the rightness of it. And that's and that's the question we've talked about here before. But I, I think there's a basic presupposition here, and it, it, people would tend to buy this, but they don't want to live according to it. And that's that everything that God has told us to do is ultimately for our best good. Is an earnest Absolutely. heart enough? I guess I would have to analyze what it means by an earnest heart. Probably. One, think, one, one, is, one is seeking to do the right thing. In answer to I your call, question, it might be a little simplistic, but doing it. it depends on the attitude it's done. When Christ mm -hmm. said, love your neighbor as yourself, that means you're getting out knocking on doors, handing out leaflets or something. If you're doing it with a pharisaical outlook, no. Mm -hmm. But <coughs> you, you're doing what you can near where you are, I think. Okay, let's just talk about some different peop ideas that people have had. There are a lot of people in our world, and there have been in the past, who we would call uni universalists. A universalist is someone who believes that so God is going to figure out some way to save everybody, even the devil. Is that, um, is that possible? It's well, all look. God's, according to that theory, it's all God's doing? Well, here's, here's the, here, we need to think about this. For hundreds of years, the Roman Catholic Church was all there was to Christianity. Mm -hmm. And basically they taught that God is up there and he's got a big stick, and if you're out of line, he's going to zap you. Okay? So they said, these universalists say, okay, thinking about it like that, how do you keep God from zapping you? Well, if God loved you, he certainly wouldn't zap you, right? So they turned to John 3.16, God loves the world, so he wouldn't zap anybody, right? So therefore, everybody's going to be saved. That's their argument. So if you have that picture of God, then the other side of that coin is you would be a universalist. My grandmother was Catholic, and she used to use, I think it was Psalm 22, mm -hmm. where he said, if, oh, yeah. if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. And she believed everybody, don't worry, you'll see everybody but in heaven. I think the likes of Boniface the Eighth is going to have some answering to do <laughs> as against the peasants that they were pushing around. Some of those peasants are going to make it. Yeah. Of and the current pope is no exception. I think we haven't heard from this man yet. <laughs> uh, okay. There are people also who believe in what we call pluralism. Such people believe that all religions are basically equal, equally valid, and each one has a potential for leading us to salvation. No religion is better than any other religion. There, all this differences between denominations and even between religions is sort of just window dressing. We all believe in love. We want to love each other. We believe that God has a good plan for us, and we all want to go there. So. Isn't that all we need to know? These people would say, if you believe that your religion is better somehow and you need to tell it to other people for those people to, be, to believe in order to be saved, you're chauvinistic and arrogant. Does that describe us? Is this where doctrine gets in the way of biblical truths? <laughs> well, some variations on doctrine, yeah. They uh, evidently haven't paid too much attention to what Jesus did and John the Baptist did. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, well what do we do? Well, go ahead. It sounds like it's it's these people are thinking that that the church is what saves you, and that used to be the it thinking. doesn't mm -hmm. it doesn't matter which church you belong to, the power is still there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But it's not really the church, it's God. Well, Jesus himself said, remember, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one goes to the Father except by me. 
Is that, is that relevant in this discussion? Let me read you another one. This is Revel that was John 14, 6. Look at Revelation 20, verses 14 and 15. Then death and the world of the dead were thrown into the lake of fire. This lake of fire is a second death. Whoever did not have their names written in the book of the living were thrown into the lake of fire. So it looks like in order to be saved, you have to have your name, you have to get your name somehow or other into the book of the living. Right? Well, you're looking at cause and effect there. Maybe it's more symbolic and there's some deeper understanding you have to come up with. Well, Lake of Fire sounds pretty serious to me. But we have to understand exactly what it is. Mm -hmm. Well, I was recently, in fact, I've been twice in the last year and a half to the country of Turkey. And I was there just a couple, two, three months ago. And we had a tour guide who was from Turkey, but he had pretty significant Christian leanings. I didn't try to pin him down whether he was really a Christian or not. But I asked him, I said, you know, the, the, if you look at the country statistics, it will say that in Turkey, 99, I think it's 99.9% .9 of the people are, are Muslim. How, how do you think that happens? I mean, is I mean, it really possible for 99.9% .9 of people who live in a great big country all to agree on something like religion? He said, well, that's simple. A simple solution to that. He says, when you're born in Turkey, they, they give you a little birth certificate, little card thing like this, and stamped right on it says Muslim. <laughs> that's <laughs> by <settled>. default. <laughs> settled. No problem. And, I mean, you know, we can, we, we can smile when we hear that, but uh, that was that. That's I mean, what happens in the Scandinavian countries? You're supposed to be Lutheran, mm -hmm. culturally. I mean, think of the countries where you're exposed to uh, Buddhist countries. If it's the statistics are like that in, in Thailand, what is it? Ninety, at least ninety-six, ninety-seven, ninety-eight percent are Buddhists. What about places where almost everybody is a Hindu? Nepal, you're supposed everybody's supposed to be a Hindu. What about communist nations? Isn't everybody supposed to be a communist? Well, we know that's not true either. Well, is it possible for people who are culturally immersed in these other religions to actually be saved because how they of how they relate to God? Could you live in a Muslim country and be a faithful Seventh-day Adventist? Could you uh, live in a Buddhist country or a Hindu country, a communist country? Even in a marriage, it's hard. I was married uh, to uh, a Catholic. I was born a Catholic, but at the age of seven, I became a Seventh-day Adventist. And for a while, I went through different churches and religion. And I married my last husband. <laughs> I've been married a couple of times. And, uh, yeah, and he was Catholic. And we had a problem because he would get little uh, cross and he would pin it. I find cross pin on him on things. When we were flying, he would pin little cross. It bothered me because it made no sense. You know, and we had, it was hard. And I would take my children one place and he would go one place. It wasn't good. Well, would you say, uh, let's, let's refine our question slightly. <laughs> would you say that somehow or other, in order to be safe to save in heaven, if I dare to use that term, that so we need to give up our selfishness and our sinfulness? Yes. No self-centered people are going to be in heaven. I think that we could make that without condemning anybody. So um, does that impact what kind of religion you can belong to? Then no one will be in heaven because I think everyone to some level is self-protection. You do for yourself first. I, be, I do. If it's like that, then no one will be in heaven. If it's, that's the only criteria, no one is selfish, no one is. Well, I didn't say that, that, that they won't get there. I said they will stay in heaven, yeah. okay? Because be self-centeredness to leads to a lot of yeah. behavior. There's, uh, there are a lot of verses. Many people don't realize how many of the verses there are in the Bible that say that we are all sinners. Absolutely. Uh, one, of the, one of the original ones I found in 1 Kings eight forty six. And this is in Solomon's prayer as he's dedicating the temple there in Jerusalem, that first big, massive, gold-covered temple. 
When your people sin against you, he's, he's, it's this prayer, Solomon is speaking to God, when your people sin against you and there is no one who does not sin, and in your anger you let their enemies defeat them and take them as prisoners to some other land, even if that land is far away, listen to your people's prayers and so forth. Now remember in Solomon's day, it was generally believed by people around and other parts of the world that okay, this part of the world is for this God, and this part of the world is for this God, and that part of the world is for that God over there. And, you know, the idea that you could go over there somewhere and God could still hear your, the, the Jehovah God could still hear your prayers, that's, that was a pretty surprising kind of an idea. I like that, it says, in your anger, you, mm -hmm. say, you let the enemies do it, okay? Right. It isn't that God's doing it, he just, that gives you up to, to your own behavior. Solomon in his old age, in Ecclesiastes 7 verse 20 said, there is no one on earth who does what is right all the time and never makes a mistake. Mm -hmm. Is that a clue? And to come to one of some of the more famous verses in the New Testament, Romans 3.23 is a classical verse. Everyone um, has sinned and is far away from God's saving presence, my version says. That sounds like what Yoli said a minute ago there. Yeah. There wouldn't be anybody that uh, <clears throat> would get to heaven if you... So what is God's response? I mean, there's a bunch of other verses that said, look at Acts 17, verse 30. What does God want? God has overlooked the times when people did not know him, but now he commands all of them everywhere to turn away from their evil, way, evil ways. So what is God's answer to that problem? Turn away from your evil ways. That's a funny text. Kind of Why? It implies that, oh, like in the Old Testament, God didn't pay too much attention to mm -hmm. a lot of things, but now he's gotten pretty picky. Well. Let's, let, let me take another one, 2 Peter 3, 9. The Lord is not slow to do what he has promised, as some think. Instead, he's patient with you because he does not want anyone to be destroyed but wants all to turn away from their sins. So now it sounds like he doesn't want anybody to be destroyed, but how do you avoid being destroyed? Repent. Turn, turn away from your sins. Repent. Yeah. Isn't, that, isn't that God's plan? An earnest heart. Okay. I like Exodus 34, 6, mm -hmm. 7. Go ahead. God is merciful and long-suffering in dealing with the sins mm -hmm. and ignorance of men, but he will not endure their sins forever. How many of those sins do you have to turn away from? <laughs> well, by the time you get to the pearly gates, you have to turn away from all of them. <laughs> Boy, that's... <laughs> you don't that's a, kick a suitcase of them up to heaven? <laughs> that's, a, that's, a, that's a pretty big... Big order. Well, you just oh, read oh, something on, a minute Jay. ago hold that on. you couldn't do that. Let, 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 let me, let, let's, let's think <laughs> about that for a moment. Is God asking you to do that on your own? No. If he's asking you to do that on your own, we'll fold up here and go home because we're wasting our time. Well, yeah, but that's still an awful lot of things to keep track of okay. to get help on. Hold on, hold on. <laughs> Does God have the ability to make those changes in you? Yes, if you allow it. If you allow it. Well, what's the time limit on that? <laughs> <laughs> no, that's not the question you're supposed to ask. You're supposed to ask, Wait, how do I do it? <laughs> uh, that's okay. a good question, though, the time yeah. limit. Well, I the mean, time is, all you need is a lot, a little bit of time. You can, you can change a lot of behavior. Yeah. Give me a couple billion years, and man, I'll really change a lot well, of things. Yeah. patience, but... but Second Peter 3.10, but the day of the Lord will come like a thief. Mm -hmm. And then and so on, so you, you're going to... So that thousand years yeah. we think we're going to be spending in heaven, is that going to be a... <clears throat> is that going to be kind of a second probationary no, time? No, it's, it's not. a learning process. <laughs> Some of <camp. laughs> Well, I, I'd like to read you a couple quotations from Ellen White regarding the death of sinners. That's what we're talking about, right? Why do some people die? What's that all about? And so, do we have any examples of what we call in the Bible the second death? Well, listen to these words about Jesus and his, exam his, his experience on the cross. The wrath of God against sin, the terrible manifestation of his displeasure because of iniquity, filled the soul of his son with consternation. 
All his life, Christ had been publishing to, to a fallen world the good news of the Father's mercy and pardoning love. Salvation for the chief of sinners was his theme. Now, we're all happy to hear that, right? But now with the terrible weight of guilt he bears, he cannot see the Father's reconciling face. The withdrawal of the divine countenance from the Savior in this hour of supreme anguish pierced his heart with a sorrow that can never be fully understood by man. So great was this agony that his physical pain was hardly felt. What is, that, what is he saying to us? He's saying that Jesus was so disturbed by being separated from his Father that that's what killed him. It wasn't, it wasn't the, the nails, it wasn't the crown of thorns. It's an agony on the part of God yeah. rather than anger or wrath or some of the other words of it. Reading on, Satan with his fierce temptations wrung the heart of Jesus. The Savior could not see through the portals of the tomb. What does that mean? Hope did not present to him his coming forth from the grave a conqueror or tell him of the Father's acceptance of the sacrifice. So when he died, he thought there was a real possibility that he would never rise. However, he feared that sin was so offensive to God that their separation was to be eternal. Wow. And yet he raised himself? Christ felt the anguish which the sinner will feel when mercy shall no longer plead for the guilty race. Are, are, are we so attached to our sins that we want to go through that kind of an experience? Or would we like to change? It was a sense of sin bringing the Father's wrath, that is, we know that God's wrath is His letting people go, letting them do what they want to do themselves, God, bringing the Father's wrath upon Him as man's substitute that made the cup he drank so bitter and broke the heart of the Son of God. He died of sin. Do we want to have that experience? That's how, the question. How is, how is that different than just dying? Would you like to ask Jesus that question? Well, I guess if we're going to think about it here, I should have some kind of an idea of what, what is entailed in that. Well, so... Of course, I, mean, I don't know what it's like to die because I'm still here. But, yeah. but, but I mean, my father you know, died a few months ago. You know, there are some we, people, we watched him die. There are some people who are not afraid to die. Well, it's not a question of being afraid to die. It's a question, do you want to die recognizing that you yourself have made choices that have torn you away from the person in the entire world who loves you the most of all. Well, are you? Do you? Are, are, you, are you ready even, to look at God's face? A lot face. of people are not even even uh, aware or cognizant of. I'm not of, arguing with that at all. Of of that. So how would that be such a negative experience? Because they. Them? And of course, we're talking about something that's even beyond earthly death. Right. So, yeah. And, and the answer to that question is that experience is going to happen after everyone who's ever lived will see the panorama. The Revelation talks about it, Ellen White talks about it, <clears throat> uh, from the beginning to the end of the history of sin. The entire great controversy will be spelled out in the sky. Steven Spielberg will be turning green because God will have 3D living color. And there it will be. And when it's finished, it'll be so compelling. Everybody will be so impressed by the truthfulness of God's case that even the devil, temporarily, very temporarily, will fall on his knees and say, yes, God, you're right. Of course, they the, converted then? Well, no, because what does he do next? Tries he jumps up and says, come on, let's attack the city. Let's take it. But no, I mean, this is a, this is a case of being, if, you know, you, I'm sure you're one of those you know, macho men that never happen, this never happens to, but have you ever gone to a movie when you felt like crying a little while later you're, you're laughing? Why is that? It's because you're moved by what you see. That's what happens to Satan. So only only God is a thousand. Then, what would be the point of the whole thing if he just goes back to what he was doing? Well, well the point is, yes, is you see a display of what what 
what he has become well, as some kind of a some kind of a natural oh. uh, not a natural consequence not that it's it's somehow it's an alteration of of your nature or something and, and what you're going to see is that every person even those the wicked who die are going to die saying it was my own choice god treated me in the best possible way he could i chose to die myself and everybody there will not be anybody who'll be left with the idea well if god had just done things a little different aunt sue could have been saved nobody be there will be not one person capable of coming out saying you know god didn't do what everything he could have done but why couldn't why couldn't one say at that point when one recognizes the justification of of how god is correct in everything that he's done and then you decide well i'm going to change my mind about all of this at the last minute well okay and why, why can't that happen okay hold on just a minute you're you're forgetting things that you know very well okay does god make any mistakes in his judgment so if God knew that it would just take a, a, a vision of, the, of, the, of that whole thing to convince you to, be, to join God's side, he would, you would already be in heaven. God doesn't make any mistakes in his judgments. So what's the, point of, what's the point of having that little lapse right there that you're talking about? Okay, let me say it again. Okay. The point is that even when the devil himself dies, he will die recognizing that it, everything that happened to him, all his evil, was his own personal responsibility. There's no way you can blame God for it. And mm -hmm. there's nothing more that God could have possibly done to save him. And that, there, wouldn't, that wouldn't convert him? Uh, Are you kidding? No, I, I'm, the devil? I just don't understand. Well, the devil, I mean, <laughs> well, you're, no, what, so what, you what, say what, the devil, what, but I'm trying to understand. Why doesn't that convert everybody when they when they because, bow their name? They're, because they're evil. Because they're evil. I mean, because. I mean, how if, you, if your question is how could the devil standing in God's presence mm -hmm. back in heaven mm -hmm. rebel against him? If you think your question is crazy, what about that one? Well, what I'm thinking about the way we're looking at it, though. But why does why does he even? Neil, I do, I don't understand that. I well, yeah. Yeah, well, let's say you and I are in a fight, and we and you you won, you beat me up, you won. I can say hey, you won, okay, you won, but that doesn't mean I have a love, and I'm gonna say okay, I love you, and this I just say okay, you won, you the winner of this. You know, I just yeah. uh, you know. okay. That's a yeah, that's a good point there. That that they're just recognizing yeah. that yeah. they won, and. Um, that's the reality of things, mm -hmm. and that's why they bow their knee. I have a question. That's, a, that's Philippians 2, if you want to read it in the Bible. Very clear. I have a question about this, uh, where it implies that Jesus didn't know if he was going to, you know, if God was going to accept his yeah. sacrifice. But if we say in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the yeah. Word was with God, that says that he knew the story, he knew the narrative. Mm -hmm. So this is problematic and scary to me to say that because he knew because he said in t if I destroy okay. this temple I'll raise it up okay let's how, let, let, how long was this this doubt I'm using that word kind of loosely in, but in Jesus mind yeah mm -hmm. was it, well, it was it, it, it you know we, we can all come to certain circumstances when we think oh my goodness this is just mm -hmm. this is just it and then when we think a little more well it isn't really it okay so yeah, and we don't have time to go through all the details of Christ's death in the Garden of Gethsemane and the whatever. But both cases, in the Garden of Gethsemane, this idea of gripping him so bad that he fell dying to the earth and an angel had to come and resuscitate him. But, and when he go to the cross, what's happening there is he's over there and he's going through this and he thinks, you know, God has abandoned me. I mean, is, is, is sin really so evil that that I, I'm God. I, I'm supposed to be God. How could my father let go of me? Is sin really that bad that, that anybody who participates in sin is just absolutely not possible for them to be reconciled to God? And he thinks that for a, for a moment, but he, he wins a few moments later by saying what? Father, into thy hand 
I have to met my spirit. So he won. So, I mean, y your question. And let me, let me move on because there's a couple more things we want to talk about. Look at Ephesians 3, 9, and 10. Christ is, in a, this is the end of a long sentence, and of making all people see how God's secret plan is to be put into effect. God, who is the creator of all things, kept his secret hidden through all the past ages in order that at the present time, by means of the church, the angelic rulers and powers in the heavenly world might learn of his wisdom in all its different forms. <coughs> the universe is learning about God and about his dealing with his children by what he's doing with us right now. And for them, for the onlooking universe, it was the time of the cross and the crucifixion. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What ways can we personally, not the pastor, not the elder or deacon, but we ourselves learn to show forth God's glory to a dying world? Can we as a group here, do we do that in this class? Or as a Sabbath school, regular Sabbath school class, or as individual Christians? Do we have a responsibility to the people around us? Well, how am I supposed to do that? Am I just supposed to be a nice guy to the people I meet in the grocery market, or I, I would, day by day, or be courteous to people on the highway? Or am I supposed to get a soapbox and go down here I, I and, would say in the evil town across the way over here and uh, <laughs> let people know about all these wonderful truths. The, if I'm going to give a simple answer, which is not nearly adequate. At my own little Mars Hill. You, the answer to that is to be as much like Jesus as you possibly can. Boy, oh boy, I'm going to get me a whip and go to church. <laughs> 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 well, if you have, if they, if you got a, mark, a marketplace surrounding your church with people selling cattle and sheep and money changing, then maybe you better. Well, and if anybody's afraid of you, you know you're not doing it right. Yeah, exactly. Well, just because they're not real cattle doesn't mean they're not doing kinds of merchandising. <laughs> Well, Sporting whatever it is, things. you can keep your soapbox at home, right? <laughs> you might end up with it. <laughs> Put it on wheels. Okay, but let's, but let's look at Paul's experience. I mean, he should be an example. He says in 1 Corinthians 9, 22 and 23, Among the weak, in faith I become weak, like one of them, in order for, to win them. So be, I become all things to all people, that I may sa save some of them by whatever means are possible. All this I do for the gospel's sake, in order to share its blessings. Now, there's a, there's a human example if you don't like the Jesus example. So you're going to save some. Mm -hmm. Not all. Well, we know that God put the children of Israel at that crossroads of the ancient civilization to be a light to the world. And instead, by and large, they put their lamp under a basket. So God in, in Christian times has taken a different approach. Instead of saying, okay, all you people who are Israelites or all you people who are Americans or whatever it is, you're the light to the world. God has said, I want you, you and you and you and you and me, I want you to scatter out through the world and be as salt, be like salt to impact those around you. And a lot of people have done that. A lot of people have lost their lives doing that. Uh, other people have been very successful. Some have converted, converted individuals, tribes, even whole nations. Think what Paul did. Well, why don't those, pl the church's plans? I recently came from a huge meeting down in San Antonio, Texas, where the church, our church, gathered together. And they said, we just, we've got to do this job. We don't want to meet five years from now. We want to be in heaven five years from now. So why, why have those plans worked out? Well, here are some suggestions from our Bible study guide. Poor planning for outreach, inadequate understanding of the task. That's one. Two, a narrow focus on mission only as education, health care, disaster relief, or development, which overshadows preaching the gospel. Three, underfunding and understaffing by the sending organizations. Does that ever happen? Four, missionaries unsuited to the task. Could it be that some people go over, go over as missionaries for the wrong reason? Or five, nations that forbid the preaching of the gospel. What are we going to do in Saudi Arabia? 
What are we going to do in Iran? Well, the going like conditions that the, the apostles had. Exactly. Just exactly the same. Mm -hmm. Well, next quote. Here's something from Scripture and something from Ellen White. Uh, Desire of Ages, page 6, 8, 633, paragraph 3, and quoting Second Peter 3.12. By giving the gospel to the world, it is in our power to hasten our Lord's return. Do we want to do that? We're not only to look for, but to hasten the coming of the day of God, Second Peter 3.12. Had the Church of Christ done her appointed work as the Lord ordained, the whole world would before this have been warned and the Lord Jesus would have come to our earth in power and great glory. So it's possible. It's possible or it didn't happen. It's not, on, it's not real. So how do you know if it's possible? Well, if you don't believe God, if you don't believe the Bible is inspired, then of course you no, 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 no. You can't I just say that. That was, <laughs> that was well. What I'm saying is, just because it says it, if they would have done it, doesn't mean that that it could have been done that way. What does it mean when that very thing wasn't accomplished in the days? <clears throat> yeah. When the author actually wrote those words. Well, we've only got about a minute left. Let me see if I can conclude. <laughs> Let's look at the other side because we believe there's a great controversy. Satan knows that if you do your job and I do my job and the rest of us do our job and we hasten the Lord's coming, it's curtains for him. It, this is a life and death matter for him because if we do our job, it's all over for him. There's a lot of... I mean, I mean look at the early disciples. They carried the, the, the gospel and within one generation, within about 30 years, they carried the gospel to all, almost all of the then known world. And they didn't have the internet, they didn't have radio, they didn't have television, they didn't have any of the things we have available today. So shouldn't we be able to do as well as they did? Well, it's clearly way back from the times of Abraham that the gospel is supposed to go to the whole world. Well, do you feel a responsibility to reach unreached peoples? And I'm, I have to stop there, I'm going to leave that challenge with you. Do you feel a responsibility to reach out to unreached peoples? A kind and wonderful Father, these are challenging questions. They're very challenging questions. They, they leave us with some very serious thoughts. What are our responsibilities? What are our responsibilities as a church or as individuals? Help us to know what you want us to do and to cooperate with the Holy Spirit in every way we can is our prayer in Jesus' name.